Well, the commons is a, a, a new and old concept of how we take care of resources and ourselves. And it's old in the sense that evolutionary sciences have told us that we've managed resources as communities uh, without necessarily having market activity of any sort for millennia. Uh, managing water, managing herds of animals, man uh, cutting down trees in ways that are sustainable for that community is a old, very old tradition. But it's very new in that we now find the internet is a hosting infrastructure for all sorts of commons from open source software to Wikipedia to social networking to open access scholarly journals. And then there's all sorts of uh, other types of commons like social commons uh, or uh, civic commons where people come together and have uh, community festivals or farmers markets or local food production systems or urban gardens. So it's really, it's, there is no master inventory of commons because a commons occurs whenever a community gets together and says they want to manage a resource for the benefit of their given community in a way that is roughly equitable and fair for everyone and sustainable. So the commons is a way of, um, of managing resources that is different from something that the state does through bureaucracy or that markets do through cash and property rights. So it's, it's a, as I say, a new and old paradigm, but one that's increasingly uh, getting more attention uh, and moving forward. I once encountered uh, a number of uh, women in a village west of Hyderabad, India, and they had been bonded laborers on a, someone else's farm working. And through their market activity could only earn enough for one meal a day. And then they had the idea of why don't we re revive the traditional farming practices that we used to have two generations ago. And they searched and found old seeds that had been forgotten forgotten because a whole new generation of market-driven seeds from the West had been introduced so that they planted monocultures, had to buy pesticides, uh, had to sell on their national and global market, uh, which as market participants they couldn't earn enough to, to feed themselves properly. But by reviving traditional agriculture, by sharing seeds with each other rather than having to buy them each year, by having seeds that were adapted to the local ecosystem, which was dry and arid in, in Andhra Pradesh, the, the state, they were able to grow enough and have enough, um, what shall I say, personal and social development as a community uh, to really have a better life and to have two meals a day than one, once they were only having one. So that's sort of a simple example of how seed, seed sharing as a commons can help emancipate people from what is often seen as the only way to take care of yourself, which is through the market or the state. And I think we find a lot of these examples of self-provisioning uh, in all sorts of unexpected places. And part of my task in life is to try to put a spotlight on these and show the logic of them, how they work socially and interpersonally to uh, produce value every bit as much as the market. It just is not encapsulated in property rights or expressed as a price. The commons is, is always takes, uh, takes on the char character of its local environment. I, I like to say that co a commons is like DNA. Uh, scientists will tell you that DNA is underspecified so that it can adapt to the local circumstances wherever it is. So that um, seeds or the DNA of people will adapt depending upon the climate, the geography, and so forth. Well, that's the way it is with commons, too. Uh, a food commons in the United States will be different from one in Europe, which will be different from one in Africa. So it's difficult to to generalize too much. There's no blueprint for a commons, precisely because human communities, the human species, vary so much uh, in its different places in the planet. That said, there are certain common principles or values that tend to animate most commons. 
And these things are like inclusiveness, having everybody have uh, access and participation, the right uh, and ability to make their own rules for governing the resource. And usually that's done in a way that both protects the resource and the community over time and identifies people who are abusing the resource or the community. So there's punishments and ways to effectively do that. Uh, so it internalizes um, the monitoring of the commons. And I suppose another simple way to say is that production, consumption, and governance are all put in together in the same package. So it's not as if the governance takes place outside of the, that community with government or law, for example. It, it tends to be socially negotiated within that community. So these are the elements of a commons paradigm, uh, which will vary between, you know, water is a different kind of resource than wildlife, which is different from forests, which is different from digital resources. So it will vary depending upon those resources. And as I say, the culture, the history, the uh, customs and norms will all affect the particular expression of the commons. But just because they're varying doesn't mean there are not commonalities. Uh, I like to say, to compare it to, if you know about mathematics, the idea of fractals, where there are different types of uh, expressions of the same idea, yet they all have a, a resemblance or kinship, uh, as if in a family. And I think this is particularly true if you compare commons to the kinds of approaches to resource management that government and bureaucracies have, where it's one size fits all and universal rules and generally uh, inflexibility and uh, very coercive means, where and the market, which uh, in some ways is more open, but also requires that you have money and that you have property rights and sometimes advertising and a whole array of things that. Uh, are more complicated and costly than a commons. So, so those, that's, that's why the commons, I think, has persisted for so long, is because it's almost a natural way of people uh, interacting and governing things. Uh, on the internet, it's a very lightweight process to create a commons, but to create a market online, it requires lawyers and advertisers and talent recruitment and marketing and so forth. Uh, such that it's, it's actually harder to create a market in digital spaces than to create a commons, which almost occurs uh, spontaneously. So these are some of the dynamics that are going on in uh, the creation and ma maintenance of commons in, in different sectors around the world. Traditional commons tend to be smaller scale. Uh, if you think about evolutionary science, they say that the largest community that one can have without some other means of making it grow larger is 150 people, uh, because that seems to be the natural capacity of human brains to identify and keep track of people. Uh, but there are, obviously, in modern times and beyond, we've created systems to help scale governance beyond smaller scale. There are all sorts of commons that are immensely larger, uh, and we can think of things like Wikipedia, which has at least 70,000 volunteer participants throughout the world uh, who are coordinating their work on different, uh, different language platforms, I think 285 uh, different Wikipedia language platforms. This is a phenomenal achievement, and it su suggests the ways that the internet allows commons to scale. Um, at the same time, there are certain limits to how those people can interact and how governance occurs. And there's a lot of experimentation going on, frankly, about how large-scale commons, at least in the networked world, should be structured. Um, in, in, for commons that deal with natural resources, I think it's a more complicated thing because uh, people could be dispersed over a wide area and how do you get them together to trust each other and cooperate? Those are major challenges, yet there are such commons that exist, uh, particularly in indigenous communities and a lot of traditional communities that can be s somewhat large, and it's because they share the same values and culture and worldview. 
so a lot of producing a successful commons of scale is about developing both the structure or architecture for governance, but also the culture and ethics that hold a people together and make people want to participate and cooperate with each other. So uh, those are some of the uh, factors that uh, go into whether a commons can scale larger. First, I think you need to talk about what you mean by law. Now, many people say law is what the state or legislatures or courts produce. And of course, that's an important kind of law. But within a commons, law is generally understood as the, the rules and uh, norms that the commoners themselves want to uphold. So I've developed with my colleague Burns Weston the, co the concept of vernacular law which can be meant, at, vernacular means something that's customary and traditional and inform, informal. And so a community will have all sorts of social law that they develop to manage something. And it may not even be written down. There may not be a formal statute or court decision, but it's every bit as influential on people's behavior and, and how, they, how they act. Um, so I think that con a modern state law tends to underestimate the power of vernacular law and social systems for getting things done. It doesn't quite know how to engage with it. Yet, that's pr probably the most morally authoritative and accepted form of law in people's lives. I don't know many state statutes and Section 3BA and what it, what it stands for. You need a lawyer for that. And I think that's one reason. And furthermore, legislatures are often uh, run by lawyers and experts and industries that have corrupted them through lobbying and so forth. So they don't, often state law doesn't have the moral authority of uh, vernacular law. And on, on top of all that, centralized institutions of the nation state, uh, bureaucracies and so forth, forget politics, are often not equipped to manage highly complex, dispersed, um, situations in, and networks have proven more valuable than that. So my point is uh, we need some sort of reconciliation or conversation between state law and vernacular law. How can commons be empowered to do important work with participation and moral legitimacy uh, yet still be in a general way answerable to the state? Uh, and I think that's really a challenge to devise some new systems of law. But it helps to remember there's a long tradition of commons law in history that has been largely forgotten. The Magna Carta and the Charter of the Forest were major uh, documents that protected for the first time uh, commons, commons law. Uh, the, people, the right of people to use the forest for their livelihood, something that the king and the landed uh, aristocrats didn't want to do. So uh, there, there are legal traditions. I think they need to be modernized. Uh, we need to be creative and inventive. But it all starts with recognizing the commons as a source of value in people's lives uh, and then crafting appropriate um, legal systems and doctrines and principles that can uh, help protect the commons. Well, for years, the commons was seen as a historical curiosity of medieval times. You know, something historians looked at, but not really significant. Uh, or we'd talk about English history and uh, what a time that was. But it wasn't until uh, social scientists began to, re to rediscover it in the late 80s and early 90s that the commons started to get more attention, at least within academia. Uh, Professor Eleanor Ostrom of Indiana University, who passed away several months ago, she was uh, arguably the leading figure in this revival, and she won the Nobel Prize in 2009 for her work in empirically documenting how commons can function quite sustainably and are quite uh, functional. They're not the tragedy of the commons, as a famous biologist, Garrett Hardin, had described. 
But I came to the Commons not through academia, but through uh, politics and policy. I had worked in Washington for Ralph Nader and a congressman and a regulatory agency. And so I had seen up close how conventional government works and how change occurred. And much of my work in the Nader world and those of my friends was fighting what I would now call enclosures of the commons in which the market was privatizing and commodifying things that belong to all of us like the airwaves used for broadcasting or uh, federal research for, for new drugs or public lands that have minerals or are used for grazing. There's a long, long list of things that belong to all of us legally or morally that are being privately appropriated and used for the market. So I, my point of access to the topic was understanding enclosure and understanding how the so-called free market quietly depended upon the commons but never really acknowledged it. It depended on the commons for cheap or discounted access to resources that the government was uh, conspiring to give away. And it depended upon the commons uh, as a place to dump uh, their waste and pollution and things that couldn't make money in the marketplace. So to talk about the commons would be to talk about those elements that standard economics and politics uh, ignores and to assert that they need to be, those resources need to be protected and uh, treated uh, through stewardship and not simply through market exploitation. So as, the, as Reagan and Thatcher took office in the 80s and the whole neoliberal consensus began to form about how the so-called free market is the only way to produce wealth and manage resources, I came to see that uh, this was based on a lot of very deep fallacies uh, about value and wealth. Uh, and so around about the mid-90s I came to see both how the liberal polity and democratic politics was not going to produce the kind of change that's needed for social justice or the environment or uh, stable communities. And I at the same time started to learn about the Eleanor Ostrom literature in the Commons and saw the growth of the World Wide Web on the internet, which went public in 1994. And I started to see open source software and Linux take root in the late 90s. And I began to realize that this was an enormous um, opportunity for developing some different ideas of governance and um, democratic control and sovereignty in ways that went beyond what the market or state could offer and in some ways took government back to governance uh, you know, in a sort of do-it-yourself, self-organized way. So for the past um, 12 or 15 years, I've been involved with a number of different activists trying to develop this discourse and analysis, in, in some ways teaching myself a new vocabulary uh, that can explain why the commons is significant in people's lives and how it offers both a critique of mainstream economics as well as a proactive, positive alternative that is not reactive but uh, simply a new paradigm that doesn't need to refer to the state or market except to the extent that they get in the way. Uh, and so we do see all sorts of such commons now, now flourishing uh, I've mentioned some of them, you know, the online open publishing and the open source, um, various open source platforms, not just software, but we have, you know, open source cars and design being, being made. And uh, I think it really is a new cultural ethic that is trying to find new ways to sustain itself. Many of these are quite small and embryonic growing. But uh, I think they, they have a, 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 a great potential that they're starting to show because they are persistent, they are growing, they're starting to interlink with each other. And I think this is a very hopeful sign at a time when conventional institutions are showing themselves to be dysfunctional and not very responsive to the, both the economic crisis but also the social needs of people. So for all of those reasons, I think the commons uh, 
has a lot of promise, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done to uh, develop the perspective, understand the different models for commons uh, provisioning of things, and uh, make it really kind of a movement, not like other movements, because it's not just political, it's not just policy related, but really kind of a cultural, personal uh, way of life and perspective for change. And I think that's really the only way we're going to have meaningful change if it works at that level. We can't simply pass laws to uh, change reality. We have to become that reality ourselves. Uh, standard economics assumes that the price system can be the mag you know, that's the magic of the market, that the price system can solve a lot of problems. But I would contend that the price system is really just a crude instrument because price is just a very narrow bit of information that doesn't ex adequately express all sorts of other types of value that people consider important. If you think of nature, many of nature's processes are long-term. They're very complex. They're dynamic and interactive. And to say, as some economists say, that nature's services are worth, worth X million or billion dollars, that the value of honeybees pollinating flowers can be expressed as this dollar or euro sum is just absurd. Yet they presume that these market mechanisms as mediated by price information can uh, adequately uh, interact with resources and express our values. Value in an economic sense, but values in a humanistic sense. So part, that's, that's really part of the dysfunction, that there's this default belief that only market-based solutions have any legitimacy or effectiveness. And I think uh, this is something we're going to have to come to terms with if we're going to deal constructively with environmental problems which is to get out of the economic framework and discourse to somehow incorporate other values. There's some rudimentary attempts to do this through alternative metrics to gross domestic product, GDP. And this is a positive sign in general. But I think that they're somewhat baby steps, and it's unclear if that will ever be operative in a policy sense, uh, these alternative GDP measures. It's sort of a belated, half-hearted attempt to say, well, you're right, there's other forms of value out there, and we'll, we'll just acknowledge this in some way. But uh, don't think for a minute that Wall Street and investment markets are going to incorporate some of these other um, uh, ways of understanding value. And that's why I think the commons as a paradigm offers such a, an important alternative, because it doesn't attempt have a single measurement of value that can be quantified in a price, it recognizes the diversity of value, yet still provides a means for governing resources uh, in a sustainable way, and I might add, recognizing limits and cultivating an ethic of sufficiency, uh, which the market has, with its uh, paradigm of homo economicus, uh, economic man, who is presumed to be rational, self-interested, materialistic, and utility maximizing without limit, uh, is frankly a fiction and an absurdity. Yet that is the presumption that uh, mainstream policymaking and economics relies upon. I think we need to talk about a different model of what a human being is and make sure our economic policies and institutions reflect that. Uh, that's really a big imperative if we're going to make serious headway uh, against the numerous social and ecological problems we have. Some people are doing commons related work without necessarily articulating it in that language. So it's really hard to say in any definitive sense and there's no master headquarters or uh, role of participants, but it gives you some idea that uh, it's been estimated that two billion people on the planet depend for their daily livelihood 
on subsistence commons of forests, fisheries, irrigation, wildlife, and so forth. Uh, astonishingly, the standard economics textbooks basically ignore subsistence commons as a viable system of governance and presume that only markets can adequately meet their needs. And I might add that subsistence is not just bare survival, but use for one's household and personal use, and not for market exploitation or profit. But uh, So that gives you a scale of what maybe is actually going on. Uh, in terms of people who are more self-consciously developing the discourse of the commons and trying to apply it in different arenas, that's far more limited. There, uh, there is, however, I think a fairly uh, robust and growing international network of activists, academics, and project leaders who are um, in conversation with each other, publishing papers, actively engaging with the commons paradigm through conferences and workshops and blogs and various writings. Much of it is outside of academia, but there's also significant work being done within academia. Uh, Professor Eleanor Ostrom helped start the International Association for the Study of Commons, which has hundreds of uh, scholars working on this topic in a transdisciplinary way. There's also a number of countries that are quite, uh, what shall I say, more receptive or active in approaching the commons. Here in Germany, uh, the Heinrich Boll Foundation is very active. They're a foundation associated with the Green Party in Germany. Uh, and the topic has a lot of mainstream uh, visibility here. Italy has seen a lot of activity on the commons, especially after a fight against privatizing water resources there. And uh, people like uh, Naples Mayor uh, uh, Luigi de Magistris, I'm not pr pronouncing his name right, uh, has been very active, and there's a number of scholar activists in Italy. The Global South, particularly places like India, have been quite focused on the commons. And in Rajasthan, there are now uh, efforts to get formal policies to protect commons of pasture land and, and water uh, resources that people use to protect them from industrial development. So uh, indigenous people are also uh, a group of uh, commoners who have embraced the ideas of what the commons stands for. But it's, uh, having said all that, this is still very much a work in progress in terms of the self-awareness and the uh, intercommunication and the coordinated uh, action at international levels. You do have organizations like the World Social Forum that have issued uh, manifestos and publications about the commons. Uh, the Commons was discussed at the Alternative Summit at the Rio Plus 20 Environment Conference. There was a major uh, Commons here in, uh, conference here in Berlin in 2010 uh, about the Commons that brought uh, several hundred people together. And another one is planned in uh, May 2013 on the economics of the Commons, which hopes to have a similar uh, turnout of people. So there's a lot going on, and I, I would say by no means do I or my colleagues direct any of this. This stuff is happening spontaneously, uh, as if there were some collective unconscious uh, happening. Uh, for example, I learned recently that an, uh, a tech trade show, people who produce computers and software, their, their trade show in March of, of 2013 is called Share Economy. Uh, I think this is really interesting, that a, a commercial industry trade show uh, dealing with software and the internet is talking about the sharing economy. So, uh, as I say, there's many unexpected and diverse uh, developments uh, of the commons internationally. And uh, part of it is simply connecting the dots and seeing what they point to. Mainstream economists have had kind of a, they, I think, show indifference or a patronizing attitude towards uh, the development of the commons. When Eleanor Ostrom won her Nobel Prize in economics, in 2009 for her work studying commons, uh, many top economists had not heard of her. 
she, after all, was a political economist uh, studying cooperation, which is not exactly what economists uh, tend to study. So she came at things from a very different perspective, and the mainstream of economics, I think, paid her little attention. She, uh, since then, of course, the Commons has gotten more attention, but mainstream uh, economics has very little pressure to entertain heterodox ideas that might undermine some of their core premises, which they believe are quite functional, thank you very much, without any change. So uh, I don't see any immediate pressure for conventional economics to change. On the other hand, the 2009 crisis had undermined, called into question, many of their core assumptions about how economies work and the, the self-regulating nature of economies, the individual as the only significant agent for, for activity in markets, and so on. I think there's a lot of soul searching going on in economics, and there is a proliferation of iconoclastic alternative economic approaches that uh, are struggling to get a hearing. We'll see how much progress they make, how insightful they are, the Commons is one of those alternative approaches that uh, is trying to, I think, redefine what economics is. It's not something that is just about quantification and prices. It's about people's lives in the original sense of economics, which if you go to the Greek word, uh, I believe it was oikos, it referred to household, the economy of the household, as opposed to a lot of these very abstracted uh, derivative ideas of uh, and quantifiable ideas of economics that, it, that the, the discipline has come to be. So I guess what I would say is economics needs to think deeply about resituating itself in social rea in ecological reality uh, and perhaps on different terms than it historically has, has uh, based itself. But this will be a long struggle both intellectually and politically. Well, I'm not enough of a historian of economics to know how it became such an insular um, parochial discipline, but it has become that. And I think partly it's because it has served the interests of commercial and corporate interests to have a whole system of thought that is isolated from social reality and accountability, to uh, purport that certain functions of the market were natural and universalistic rather than something we socially create and socially maintain. Uh, I mean, when you think about markets, they require enormous amounts of state intervention and uh, regulation to ensure their, their functioning. Um, the financial market requires enormous oversight and regulation to ensure trust and a certain level of transparency and functionality. When people uh, produce harmful products or there's planes crash, government needs to step in to regulate to, re to reassure trust in the market. So the market has always been not free, but closely allied with the state. And to the extent that the state and market have now become a duopoly, uh, mutually supporting each other, the state depending upon tax revenues and growth uh, growth especially to avoid social equity and redistribution uh, fights, and the market to have government provide infrastructure and public goods and an educated uh, population and so forth. The market and state are really in this deep alliance, I think to the detriment of the commons and shared resources and things that cannot be marketized. Uh, so I think these are some of the reasons why economics has not wanted to evolve. It's seen itself as a very functional closed universe and as a, a, a very highly respected prestigious priesthood uh, that rewards those who make a lot of money. Uh, so there's a lot of complicated, you might say, anthropological reasons why economics has not evolved and frankly why it's going to be a political struggle uh, to broaden the scope of its intellectual interest. Uh, 
uh, and to acknowledge alternative forms of value that price doesn't, don't capture, prices don't capture. Um, so there's many fronts to this. I think we see a lot of it in the North, global north and global south confrontation uh, where the north has been exploiting ex extractive uh, resources from the south and uh, the economics of the north justifies that. Uh, a lot of the premises of economics are based on political theories from the 18th century. I think some of those, including John Locke, need to be revisited. Uh, the networked environment has changed a lot of core premises of value and property rights. We should revisit that, but you know, economists are not at the forefront of network economics. If anything, they're rear guard defenders of archaic 20th century business models. And that, so economics provides a, just, a justification theory for many types of social relationships that I think we should frankly revisit. And if we don't, I think we're going to have more and more of the kinds of confrontations we see in Madrid and the Occupy movement in Greece and so forth between a, a, an unresponsive, brittle, um, archaic type of thought which purports to be naturalistic and universal, universalistic but is in fact really an instrument of widespread social oppression of the 99% as Occupy says. So these are some of the reasons why economics, I think, remains very uh, conservative, if not at times, reactionary. A major problem in advancing the commons paradigm is, I think, the dependence of mass media, corporate media, conventional journalism, on familiar ideas and metaphors. It, they, they deal in short bites, headlines, and a new idea is quickly stereotyped, you know, categorized as, oh, well, Occupy was, we, that was the 60s, you know, protest. And, and in other words, it sort of sim oversimplifies and neuters anything fresh and new and doesn't understand where it might be coming from. And of course, the idea of the commons has little standing in conventional media, what's that? Or they'll understand it in the most crude terms. So I think the role of, of uh, in, indie media, uh, unaffiliated media, networked uh, blogs, social networking, is really going to be an important force in developing a different kind of public than mass media has any interest in developing. Because it simply doesn't fit with their business model of aggregating the biggest possible audience. You don't do that with a new idea. And that's why intelligent conversation on mass media is relatively rare. Because they're about building a, a franchise of churning out the same thing again and again at the lowest possible cost. And we know that journalism and intelligent conversation either costs a lot of money or doesn't attract a huge audience, uh, at least a huge general uh, audience. So, indie media is going to play a critical role in advancing this revolution of consciousness, if it ever comes to that. But mass media will not likely, or if they do, they'll be a latecomer to the game, and will probably try to uh, distort it for the interests that they represent. Because after all, they are corporate media serving public market, public capital markets. and. Uh, that's one reason why journalism has been hollowed out in the past you know, past ten years. Uh, that business model is eroding. So it's a challenge finding media to communicate this and to build the constituencies to make it go forward. In its broadest sense, my intuition is that many of the categories that we've accepted as quite normal between the individual and the collective, between public and private, between subjective and objective, are starting to blur, if not collapse. And I think that people are, especially in the context of the internet, are exploring different ways of being, different ways of providing for their livelihoods, different ways of satisfying themselves as human beings, in ways that 
economics simply does not speak to, doesn't understand, uh, except in the crudest ways of more, more, more. Um, and, and I think we're finding that this is running up against the limits of the planet. And if climate change does nothing else, it's going to force us to re-examine some of the uh, cultural and political and social assumptions we have about modernity, uh, perhaps even the Enlightenment, uh, about what it is to be a human being. Uh, because clearly the path we're on is not sustainable. And nature, uh, which we perceive as separate and uh, outside of us, is informing us that this is not going to last. I think many people are struggling to find how we can re-situate humanity within nature in a more integrative way, in a more intersubjective way, as opposed to we human that nature uh, as an object. And uh, we see this in Ecuador and uh, Bolivia, which talk about Pachamama, Mother Earth. The Western mind groans and rolls their eyes uh, at this apparent pre-modern sentimentalism. But I think that it has a lot to say about how we can start to act more respectfully towards the resources we depend upon, which the market, politicians, economics, has given us little or no guidance on, uh, except a series, an endless series of band-aids uh, that continue on and on, as opposed to re-examining some of the core premises that animate our self-destructive behavior. So, I think it's a mistake to see what we need to do as simply out there for politicians or policymakers to somehow find some magic solution. I think this is really a culture-wide uh, inquiry, introspection, self-examination about how we're going to order ourselves as a society, uh, as mature adults on a lonely planet, uh, as opposed to reckless, uh, ignorant and very short-sighted uh, species. Uh, you know, evolution has not stopped, it's continuing, and uh, there are ecological limits that are staring us in the face. So I, I, I think that we are part of this larger drama of trying to re-examine the human species and uh, our historical circumstances on Earth. Uh, I don't mean to be grandiose about it, but I do think it reaches that deeply into what has to be examined if we're going to find a new rapprochement with, with nature and each other. And the, the encouraging news is there is a lot of spontaneous uh, interest in people self-selecting to talk about the commons. I think my, my hunch is that people see the commons as a way to reconnect with with each other uh, in common purpose, uh, as opposed to the extreme individualism and atomization that market culture encourages. So in some ways it's a reaction to the extremities of market culture. In other ways, it's the pure satisfaction and joy of social cooperation in creating something new for collective benefit. I have a, just a question. It's a bit a different question, <laughs> but you can perhaps relate it to your to your studying field. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, you can answer however you want, uh, even not answer. It's okay. Good. Okay. What is love? What is love? Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, one could say, and one could be accused of being a sentimentalist, that love lies at the heart of a lot of this interest in the commons. I don't sort of think that's necessarily uh, the way to lead a political campaign because it, of course, would be so misconstrued and politics is politics and love is love. Yet, I would say that people do have a yearning to connect with each other uh, in the flesh as human beings with a full spectrum of who they are as opposed to interacting as um, demographic categories uh, in somebody else's marketing plan uh, with spectacle and sensation. Now, you know, uh, it's hard to argue, they say, with billions of dollars made by that kind of market activity. But I do think 
people are searching for a way to connect. And it does, therefore, get, if, if what you want, you can call it love, you can call it human connection, you can call it uh, empathy and the human condition. Uh, people are searching for means to make that happen because I think it's part of, uh, uh, a friend of mine calls it enlivenment. Uh, let's go from the enlightenment to the enlivenment. And I think that the commons is a vehicle for fulfilling a lot of human aspirations that other arenas of life are not going to provide. Um, and this will be through cooperative means, through understanding other human beings not as the other in some stereotyped way, but as part of us, uh, and coming to grapple with that, which is not easy. Uh, so to that extent, if you want to say love as a synonym for respect and inquiry into the human condition, I think the commons is about love in that sense very much. Uh, can we have a politics of presence, human presence, or is it going to be a politics of stereotypes that can sell and win elections? Uh, can we find governance that respects human beings as opposed to treats them as um, objects of social engineering. Uh, can humans develop the agency for their own governance, in real agency and not just pretend agency like voting every four years uh, for pre-selected candidates? These are some of the questions that I think your question provokes uh, about uh, can, we, can our politics and institutions draw upon a deeper well in the human experience and maybe bring out some of the better aspects of humanity rather than uh, demeaning or degrading uh, or defacing what humanity should be about.